Welcome everyone uh, to Ascend TV Live on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host Keith Halperin. And I'm your co-host Will Burdick. Thank you, Will. Um, and today our guest is Jan Johnston Tyler, owner and founder of uh, Eva Libre Consulting. She will tell us much about it. Uh, but before we begin, well, I was noticing earlier you have an interesting shirt. Could you stand up and show us and talk about it? Well, for, for, for this week's shirt is, is my USF is my USF sports shirt. Um, I'm wearing I'm wearing this is to promote the, the start of the USF sports season. USF is back and and they're they're going back to having sports their sports games in person, starting with volleyball and soccer. Thank you, thank you very much, Will, um, for that. Um, would you like to begin uh, with your questions for uh, Jan here? Tell us about your background. Great, I'd be happy to, Will, and I'm really happy to be here with everybody today. So my background, um, I am a native Californian. I actually, uh, my family moved here as part of the original Westward Ho Protect in the late 50s, early 60s, back when places like Varian and Xerox Park and all kinds of other wacky places that were sort of spin-offs of Stanford started up here in Silicon Valley. And my father was an electrical engineer. <clears throat> and uh, so I grew up in, in this madness we call Silicon Valley. And uh, I ended up actually being kind of a late convert to tech. I have a degree in English literature from UC Berkeley, and I wanted to be a high school teacher. That uh, was quickly uh, changed because Prop 13 had passed, and so there were no teaching positions in California. So instead, I did the next big thing, and I became a bartender uh, and uh, did that for a while, and then actually did my, my first or my second love outside of literature which was working as a professional chef in what was then known as Gourmet Ghetto in Berkeley with Chez Panisse and all of that. And I did that for about eight years. And then when I was about 28 years old, I realized, you know, this is hard work. I don't think I want to do this forever. Physically demanding. I had been running a, um, a catering company in San Francisco. So I went back to school and I got my certificate in technical writing. And that was how I got into tech myself. And I ended up with a department of 250 people and I was managing central doc services doing really bleeding edge technology of on demand doc publishing, which nobody was doing. We actually, I was at Cisco, we published a CD-ROM for the first time. Nobody else was delivering content on CD-ROM or on the internet at the time, it was all paper doc. And uh, we were doing this weird thing called these HTML files. And you had to launch this strange application on the CD called Alta Vista, so, which was one of the original web browsers. So I have a deep and, and abiding love for all things tech now. Um, and I did that for about 20 years. And, and while I was doing that, I had my first kid. Um, and my first kid uh, was diagnosed at age four with what we then called Asperger syndrome. And over time, I decided that, you know, I didn't love tech so much anymore, and I was going to go back to school and I was going to get my master's in counseling psychology with an emphasis in career with the explicit uh, desire to help uh, neurodiverse individuals between high school and college was my thinking at that time, figure out what they were good at, what their passions were, and help them into really good careers. And so I did that. And in 2007, I graduated and started Eva Libre Consulting, just me, myself, and I. And now I have 14 employees and we offer a variety of services. Can you tell us more about your organization? Sure, I'd be happy to. So Eva Libre right now has a variety of different offerings. So uh, we do job coaching, mostly for uh, people in professional jobs. We also have therapists on staff who are very good at working with neurodiverse individuals. We provide social skills training using the peers uh, material that we've altered slightly. 
We also provide class other classes and social groups so that we have gaming night on Friday. We also have a coffee club that we run and all virtual net right now. So you have to bring your own coffee. Um, and uh, we also will be starting hopefully before the end of the year, a 35 and up group uh, for older folks on the spectrum to chat. We also are department of rehab vendors. So we provide uh, employment services through DOR for neurodiverse individuals all throughout the state of California. Now we just recently got vendorized in Orange County in San Diego. We're very happy about that. And uh, we also work with high school students. So we're a non-public agency through the California Department of Education, which means that school districts can hire us to work directly with their students. Now, Will, I understand you, you have some uh, follow-up for Jan as well. What, adv what advice would you give to students with, or, or adults with autism or who, 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 who are looking to join into the program? So I think, you know, it depends where they are in life, but we, you know, for people who are seeking employment, uh, if you are, pardon me, if you're an adult, we want you to be busy, right? One thing that we see is a lot of families will come to us with the couch surfers, as we call them. So these are the teenagers or the young adults who um, have kind of given up hope and who are lounging on their couches or playing their PS2 or, you know, PS4 all day long and aren't, um, actively seeking employment. So we want to be a little bit more regimented in our job search. So we tell people that we want them searching for their jobs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, Monday, because many jobs are posted on Sunday nights. Uh, there's, you know, cron jobs that spawn and post everything. And so we want our people to be at the top of the list when they submit their resume. People don't realize that if you don't get your resume into the top 100, no one is ever going to see it. And I would say sometimes even the top 10, you want to make people understand that you're eager to apply for a job and that you're on it. If you apply to a job weeks later, you know, I mean, it's fine if you've just started then, but if you're just not paying attention, you're not going to get the job. We want to see people who are eager and on it, right? So that's important. The other is I want to see that people, especially if they've been out of work for a while, you got to be doing something. Um, I really believe that even volunteering, you know, is a really good way to show that you are participating in life, right? That you are actively contributing to society. So, you know, it's fine to be, you know, depending on what you're doing or what kind of job you're seeking, to be um, doing beach cleanups if you're interested in environmental science, uh, if you are interested in tech that you're helping at a nonprofit redesign their web page. There's a lot of different ways that you can be involved and show competency while you're looking for a job. Again, that shows an eagerness to be doing something, especially for people who've been out of work for some time, because that can be difficult to get that engine started again, because employers continue to be a little wary about big gaps in a uh, resume, not to say you can't overcome it, but it's, it can be difficult. So I think that those are kinds of things that we are typically asking people to do when they're looking for jobs. We also want them to apply for jobs that they meet 60 or 70% of the criteria. A lot of folks on the spectrum, spectrum are very, very literal. And so they may read through a job description and they may see one thing on it that they don't match. And so they won't apply. And my, my uh, advice is no, go ahead and apply because what they're asking for, and, and this is another thing we've seen in the job market, where employers are asking for just silly, dumb requirements. You know, we used to joke that back when HTML was eight years old, people were asking for 15 years experience. We're seeing the same kind of silliness now, right? So if you have two years experience of Java and they're asking for 15, you know, and yet the job is low level enough and you can do the rest of it, for goodness sake, go ahead and apply. So that's the type of advice that we would be giving. You have to stay on it. You have to track the jobs that you've applied to. You need a Google spreadsheet and list them all out and you need to take it seriously. 
Now, one of the things that sometimes happens is parents come to us and they will say, my son has a degree from Expressions College in video game design and he wants to be a video game designer. So we might look at that person's portfolio if it exists and we will ask, you know, do you have a portfolio we can see? Oh, well, no, I never did one. Well, if you're trying to get into visual arts and you don't have a portfolio, you're not gonna get the job. If you are trying to become a software engineer and you don't have a GitHub, you're probably not gonna get the job. So we're gonna work with people to help them understand what the, what the industries really are demanding that you show them and help them create those materials so that you have a leg up. I will tell you though, Will, for a lot of people who come to me with one of those degrees, I send them back to school, whether it's Coursera or a local community college, they've really got to improve their chops. You want to get into those lines of work, you have to really be beyond, I've had some experience with that program. I want to see proficiency. I want to see you really good at it. Stacy, over to you. I understand you have some questions uh, for Jen as well. Yeah. How do you, how do you get people to be motivated? A really good question, Stacy, because we do know that in their young adulthood, oftentimes um, are struggling with depression and anxiety. It's very, very common. I used to say that if you make it to 18 and you don't have depression, you've lived a charmed life if you're neurodiverse. So a lot of people um, struggle with motivation. They struggle with uh, wanting to do something that seems incredibly hard. And, you know, especially for people who've been looking for a job for a while, right? You know, there's the, the desire just to give up. This is too hard. I've been doing this for too long. So we use a technique we call a swift kick in the ass, frankly, <laughs> where we are very gently and in a friendly way, you know, kind of bucking them up and going, nope, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do it. You can do it. We're going to help you. And, um, and that works pretty well, right? We're pretty chill people. We're, we're a little goofy, a little funny, and it works pretty well. I think when people understand that we're really in this for them, not to make them do things they hate for no good reason, but because we all want the same goal. And, you know, we oftentimes will, if we have somebody who we believe is deeply depressed and that depression's not being treated, we will talk to them, we will talk to parents if appropriate and say, this person needs therapy, this person may need medication, this is a medical problem, we need to have this sorted out before we can work with them. Um, because it's really critical that they take care of themselves and that they're well enough to do a good job search. So motivation is really important. We also believe that structure is really important to, to uh, any job search, but also to develop motivation, right? I mean, I know when I've got a day off, I, you know, on a rainy day, I can sit on my couch and watch, net, watch Netflix all day too, right? We all can do that. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that once in a while, but the house still needs to get clean. The bills still need to get paid, you know, all that. So learning how to kind of kick yourself in the butt and learning how to have fun but to keep it, you know, relatively short term so that you can turn and get yourself up and go do the work of life. That's an adulting skill, right? And we want to teach those adulting skills too. Self-care is super important, but part of self-care is also getting off the couch. Uh, Jennifer, you have a question, I believe, regarding burnout for Jan. Yes, I actually have two questions. Number one, there's a stereotype that everyone on the autism spectrum enjoys doing boring, repetitive tasks. And that's the kind of job that they should be placed in because that's the kind of job they would do best. For me, it's not true. And I struggle with feelings of burnout when I'm working one of those jobs. The other part of the question is there are a lot of people who start off highly motivated, highly passionate, highly interested, highly idealistic, they, they really care, they really want to make a difference, but once they get down into the grind and the job turns out to be less than 100% pleasurable, they lose their motivation and simply don't want to do it anymore. So how do you help people deal with that? 
So a really good question, Jennifer, thank you. So at the base of it, there, there's really two pieces to the answers here. One is uh, many neurodiverse people have what I would call low distress tolerance. So it's difficult for them to kind of hold their, their um, central nervous system in check while they're doing work they don't want to do, right? There's research that's going on all the time about the limbic system in neurodiverse people, about the stressors, about anxiety, the, uh, the interplay of cortisol and adrenaline and how those impact neurodiverse people. And I, I'm fascinated by that. <clears throat> but it's an absolute incorrect trope. Let's just say it outright, you know, that autistic people like repetitive, boring work, please. Um, you know, that's, that's really demeaning and it's not true. Now, is it true that some people on the spectrum like to have something that's very set and cut and dried and very predictable to do? Yes, some people on the spe spectrum do. However, to say that everybody is like, that is silly, right? We will quote Temple Grandin, right? Everybody is different on the spectrum. So um, I would say that it's imperative that people and employers in particular understand that you know, you're hiring a fully functional human being with a brain that's just a little bit different and has some um, different qualities that you can maybe harness in a workplace, but you can't just put them in a quiet room and have them you know, count beans all day. That's demeaning. So we want to make sure that everybody has a good and lively job that actually challenges them in their career. Having said that, um, there is crap in every job, right? <laughs> number one. Number two, most of us will have to have those crappy jobs earlier in our career that we are less than thrilled with. I call it lily padding, right? You have to start with crappy job number one. You learn everything you can, you get cred, you have put something on your resume. Then you go to crappy job, somewhat less crappy job number two. You work there for a little bit, now you're making a little more money. You've got a better title. You go to you now somewhat decent job number three, right? So that's how careers are developed over time. And, you know, we all, you know, me, everyone else in the world has to kind of do that. Sometimes you get those series of jobs in one company. Oftentimes you'll have to leave a company. That's the time you go work with Department of Rehab or you hire somebody else to help you, right? Um, I used to hire people to help me with my career and look where I am now. So that's one part of it. The other is though, you know, really, I think it's important for us to recognize that um, everybody on the spectrum deserves to have a good job, but people on the spectrum also need to understand that not every job, even a great job is going to be fun all the time. They call it work. For a reason. Do you have any uh, concluding words of wisdom or advice to our community members? One, and two, how can our community members contact you at Evo Libre? Got it. Um, I think that my parting words of wisdom would be somewhere along the lines of don't give up. Um, it's really important. It's hard to find first jobs for everyone. And being neurodiverse, it can be even harder. There's no doubt about it. When I changed careers to become a tech writer, it took me almost two years to get my first job. Um, and I had to be really smart about how I changed careers. So work with someone. It's really important not to struggle alone, but to make sure you're reaching out and don't give up. The other pieces, you have to be flexible. You may not get exactly what you want, but you gotta start somewhere. So those are my parting words. In order to get in touch with us, it depends on the service you want to reach out for. If you're interested in therapy or independent living skills or our social groups, please reach out to intake at evolibri, E-V-O-L-I-B-R-I.com. If you're interested in help with job seeking and you're a DOR uh, consumer, please email us at DOR at evolibri.com. And if you're interested in checking out our website, please do so at www.evolibri.com. Thank you again, Jen Johnson Tyler. Uh, you've been a, a great guest. You're a fantastic resource for our community and keep fighting the good fight for us all. <laughs> Thank you. Now over to uh, Stacy Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. 
Thank you, Keith. Um, today, I'd, I'd like to share uh, a few things. Um, the San Francisco uh, Academy of Science, um, I believe, has opened up, reopened, and at 55 Concourse Drive in Golden Gate Park. Um, Mondays through Saturdays, it's open from 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sundays, um, 10 to 11 a.m. or something. Oh, I'll have to relook that. Well, you can go to the californiaacademy.org um, to check that out. And, yeah, and um, if you want to, I highly recommend, you know, so, I, I read somebody's review on like their brother, how much he loved the animals and was so curious and was always asking questions. So the, the California Academy of Science is always a great place to uh, explore for those on the spectrum. Um, September 9th, uh, there is going to, Ch Chupin is having a Rosh Hashanah art event. Um, it's said that it's to, you are to register by September 1st, which is past. However, if you're new to them, uh, you can go to their website and um, they will, um, there's something you could fill out at the jfcs.org. That way, um, it, this will be an adult for adults with or without uh, developmental differences um, who need uh, little to no support to participate. Uh, fees only 20 bucks. Again, go to their website and fill out the info. Hopefully you can get into it. Um, and Saturday, September 15th, uh, there is going to be this walk at Chrissy Field on the Easty Beach. And it says to join Lisa and family for a walk on the side of the path, um, highlighted by a variety of birds that you will see on the other side of things. And um, it's a, the, um, it is a one mile or so walk uh, to Warming Hut. Shorter distance is always an option. And so that is happening September 18th. And you are free to hang out at the beach as you wish. Now our final segment, we will hear from our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks. Thank you, Keith. Today, I would like to tell you about Anything But Typical by Nora Raleigh Baskin. This book appears on the Oakland Public Library's list of best children's books that have disability themes. And Anything But Typical is about a 12-year-old boy on the autism spectrum. And it's told from a first-person point of view, which is quite rare in both children's and adult literature to hear directly from a first person point of view from someone on the spectrum. So we really get a chance to understand how his mind works, his <laughs> sensory struggles, emotional overload, his questions about why people can't just say what they mean because life would be so much easier to understand that way. Of course, it would also make for some very boring stories in literature and this young man is very into creative writing. He's a lot like I was at that age because I started getting interested in creative writing at that age. And also his least favorite classes are physical education and art class, which incidentally were my least favorite classes at that age. Unlike me, however, he doesn't fit the stereotype of being the math nerd or the science nerd or one of those kids who are really smart and get high test scores, which is we all know is the only thing schools care about, but have trouble making friends. He's not an academic genius. He's actually academically behind his peers in most subjects with the exception of language arts. Now the, the story revolves around how this young man, Jason, develops an online friendship. Now, often it is easier to develop, cultivate relationships over the computer instead of face-to-face. -face. It may seem paradoxical to those with a neurotypical mind, but to those with an autistic mind, it actually makes more sense. And so he, he befriends a girl named Rebecca, 
who is also interested in creative writing, they start exchanging stories on a website called Storyboard. Matt, Stacey, do either of you happen to know if that's a real website? Anyway, for the story, it doesn't matter. So they start exchanging stories, they start communicating with each other, exchanging emails, you know, the way that typical friends would do or might do. And then it comes up that there is a convention in Dallas, which is where Rebecca lives. And Jason is lucky to be living in Connecticut near Yale University, which is home of the famous Yale Child Study Center. So he was lucky to be identified at a young age. At first, he's happy that he gets to go to the convention, even though he's a little bit nervous about being surrounded by all those people, all those strangers. But then he gets a message from Rebecca that says she lives in Dallas and she's going to be at the convention. And, and then he gets really nervous and a little bit frightened because he's afraid to meet Rebecca because he's afraid that once Rebecca meets him in person, she won't like him anymore because he's had so much trouble making friends with making in-person friendships with kids in his own neighborhood. He does have one lunch buddy that he eats lunch with in the cafeteria, but he doesn't even consider that boy to be, his, to be a close friend. Yeah, it's a struggle that I'm sure many of us on the spectrum can relate to. Well, folks, that's our program for this week uh, for Zen TV Live on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Stacey Kennedy. And I'm Jan Johnston Tyler. And uh, until next time, stay well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm.